honor of hosting you all for this certificate course on competition law and policy. And I am very proud to welcome our keynote speaker for the course, Dhanendra Kumar sir, who was the first and former chairman of Competition Commission of India and has played a very significant role in development of competition law in India. Uh, sir was instrumental in setting up its enforcement machinery, regulations, systems, and procedures and steering the commission in its initial year of existence from 2009 to 2011, especially its MND regime. On completion of his term in CCI, he headed the experts committee to frame the draft national competition policy and suggesting amendments to the Competition Act 2002. He also chaired the committee of experts of the Ministry of Housing to suggest regulatory reforms in the real estate and housing sector. Before joining CCI, Sir was India's executive director at the World Bank from year 2005 to 2009, where he also represented Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Bangladesh. He was also secretary in Ministry of Defense Production, D Transport, etc. He also served in Haryana, where he is known for development of Udyog Bihar, Manesar, and industrial development. We are very glad to have you here, sir. And uh, today, sir is going to discuss about the history behind introduction of Competition Act 2002 and what were the laws which existed prior to enactment of Competition Act and what were the loopholes which existed and which led to enactment of Competition Act 2002. Uh, and participants are requested to put their uh, questions in the chat box and we will take them at the end of the session. Now over to you, sir. Welcome once again on behalf of Veteran Results. Thank you very much, uh, Varsha, for this very generous uh, introduction. Uh, friends, let me first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on a matter which is dear to my heart, competition law. I have been asked to speak on the history behind introduction of competition law, uh, the current competition law 2002, the, the genesis, the history, what led to it and so on and so forth. I'm particularly pleased to speak to my young friends because at heart, I'm basically a teacher I started off my career journey in 1965 as a teacher, uh, and I remained so for three years before I joined the IAS in 1968. And I still consider that phase of my career as the most stimulating and depressing uh, period of my career. Well, friends, let me first of all tell you that soon after independence in 1947, what was behind the minds of the policy makers was the prevention of concentration of wealth and economic power and achievement of a socialistic pattern of society. This emanated from the constitution which India adopted. Article 38 of the constitution said that the state shall strive to minimize the inequalities in income and endeavor to eliminate inequalities in status, formalities, and opportunities, not only amongst individuals, but also amongst groups of people residing in different areas or engaged in different vocations. So naturally, at that time, the policy makers had in the front of their thinking, how to create a society which is socialistic, where there are no concentrations of income, no exploitation, and we have a, a, a good society where everybody gets his due role, in a due share in the pie. So after independence, to ensure industrialization, first of all, in Industrial Policy Resolution 1956, it was formulated, which was based on socialistic pattern of society. And the core principles were regulations and control by the state on the levers of economy, 
LPG as it's commonly known as license, permit and government control system. There was a feeling that uh, we should avoid situation when uh, the levers of power and the wealth passes on into the hands of few. Soon after this, the government also constituted three committees. One was Hazari Committee, and its report was based on industrial licensing procedure, whether it was achieving the desired goals. In its report, it concluded that the working of the licensing system had resulted in disproportionate growth of some of the big business houses in India. The second study was conducted by the uh, Mahalan Bees Committee. It was on distribution and levels of income in 1964. This also concluded that there was a concentration of power and it highlighted that the functioning of the economic model of the country had resulted in a huge disparity in income distribution in the hands of a few influential groups. The third study was conducted on Monopoly's inquiry. It was a report of A.C. Das Gupta, and the committee was also uh, came to the conclusion that uh, there was indeed a concentration of wealth, and uh, something needs to be done. Uh, it was a concentration in product-wise and industry-wise concentration, and the monopolies and restrictive practices they uh, existed. So a bill was drafted, which later became MRTP Act. And it was designed to uh, prevent concentration of economic power. It was aimed at concentration, uh, prevention of this concentration to the common detriment and prohibition of monopolistic trade practices, restrictive trade practices, and unfair trade practices. It covered all areas of business, such as sales, advertising, promotion, packaging, purchasing, investment, pricing, production, mergers, um, amalgamation, and everything. So a very comprehensive study took place. And then the enactment of MRTP Act, it was undertaken, which was based on socio-economic philosophy, enshrined uh, in, in the directive principles of the uh, state policy. This MRTP Act of 1969, however, underwent certain amendments in 1974, 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, and 91 um, to plug various loopholes which had been found in the functioning of the Act. Uh, the amendments of 82 and 84 were based on the recommendations of Justice Rajinder Satcha, known as the Satcha Committee Report and a few others similarly on finding various loopholes. Such a committee pointed out that advertisement and sales promotion, which were well-established modes of modern business techniques, uh, they were sometimes, they were deceptive, they were fictitious bargain uh, advertisements, and uh, sometimes the buyers were lured into believing that they were getting something for free or very cheap uh, when they were, it was tied uh, with some other uh, products. Uh, so the committee also felt that the advertisement should be fair. They should give full truth, avoid half truth, and uh, there should not be any misleading advertisements. So MRTP Act in its uh, formulation is also in its implementation had three basic uh, trade pillars to avoid monopolistic, unfair, and restrictive trade practices. Monopolistic trade practices covered unreasonableness of the price charge, unreasonableness in preventing or lessening competition in the market, and increasing prices, profits, limiting technical development. Restrictive trade practices included distortion, restriction of competition, and service of goods and services, any minimum. Unfair trade practices consisted of any deceptive, fraudulent, or unethical met methods in uh, running the business, misrepresentation, false advertising, in tied sales, and so on and so forth. So MRTP Commission, it uh, was suited to the uh, needs of the society at that time, and uh, it had all the powers of the civil court, 
Now, there was a director general who assisted the commission in the inquiry and investigation in all these uh, areas. But uh, it didn't uh, have any, uh, it was a toothless kind of a body. It could not impose any penalties, could only pass seize and desist order, but it had a fairly comprehensive charter. Then came the Competition uh, Act in 2002, and the basis, the genesis was essentially the new economic policy of 91, which opened the Indian markets. And uh, as uh, it was stated by the government at that time, to unleash the animal spirit among Indian entrepreneurs. And the idea was that uh, the private entrepreneurship, private enterprise um, should function, flourish, and grow as big as it can. There was no bar on your becoming big. Bigness was not frowned upon. It was the abuse of bigness or dominance that was to be frowned upon. And uh, then uh, there were a number of other things which were noticed. And, the, and globally, uh, the, uh, the, the trend, the tendency was promotion of competition and bring out the best out of the competition because competition is good for economic growth. And uh, the, as the Adam Smith, uh, the saying goes, there is an inv invisible hand, and which uh, controls the functioning of the market based on the principles of competition. So, an expert committee was constituted in the Ministry of Commerce, which was headed by Dr. Chakravarti, who was a member of the MRTP Commission, and it addressed several issues which contain to mergers, amalgamations, acquisitions, foreign investments anti-dumping measures, safeguarding measures, state monopolies, exclusive rights, technical barriers to trade, and so on and so forth. So uh, it brought out a number of factors, but the government wanted a, a, a completely new and uh, a, a legislation which was in accordance with the global trends. And a committee was constituted um, under the chairmanship of SBS Raghavan, and that committee uh, worked uh, intensively, they uh, invited uh, comments from uh, various stakeholders. And uh, finally, the uh, government drafted a bill, which uh, again was uh, uh, taken up for wider consultation. And after intensive scrutiny by the Parliamentary Standing Committee, the Parliament passed the bill in December 2002, and a law was enacted. Uh, under the name of Competition Act in 2002. The Act was received the assent of the President on 13 January 2003, and uh, then, then came the Competition Act 2002. However, the implementation of the Act could not be taken up immediately because there was a legal challenge to the law, uh, the Brumbeth case, and uh, it was stayed by the Supreme Court. However, there was an amendment, uh, a comprehensive amendment taken up to the Act in 2007, which among other things also incorporated the establishment of an appellate tribunal, uh, competition appellate tribunal, which would be headed by a former Supreme Court judge or a uh, senior uh, person like him, like a former uh, Chief Justice of the High Court. And then this uh, competition appellate tribunal uh, would ensure that there was a judicial rigor in the appeals. Even the appointment of the chairman competition commission was to be done in a manner that a, a, a committee headed by a sitting judge of the Supreme Court and a few other uh, experts, they would be, uh, they would pick up uh, a suitable person uh, as chairman, and the government on the recommendation would appoint the chairman. Uh, I was privileged to have been appointed as the first chairman of the Competition Commission of India soon after my return from the World Bank, when I, where I was India's executive director, the World Bank in Washington. And I took oath on 28 February uh, 2009, and soon thereafter, there were other members who were also appointed. The implementation of the Act was taken up in two stages. First was the antitrust portion, uh, which was taken up in May 2009. 
20th May to be precise. And the second portion was taken up on the review of mergers and acquisition in 2011, June 2011, and there was a history to it, which I'll briefly explain. Uh, under the Competition Act, if you see, unless there is a chairperson and a minimum of two members, the commission is not deemed to have been constituted, and unless the commission is not constituted, the enforcement functions cannot be undertaken. So the government uh, notified the enforcement functions uh, accordingly, on the 19th of May, the appellate tribunal was uh, constituted and Justice Pasayat, the former judge of the Supreme Court, was sworn in. And uh, 20th May, a pass or antitrust uh, and this was taken up. Uh, I may also briefly uh, dwell upon the main differences between the Competition Act and the MRTP, although I've, uh, I've hinted about it. MRTP Act was a different uh, uh, era legislation which was meant to prevent concentration of economic power in the hands of a few. And uh, uh, competition law, on the other hand, is a modern law, a positive and uh, forward-looking law, which uh, uh, looks at uh, con not only controlling monopoly, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, ensuring that uh, uh, there is a real competition, as I'll briefly come in a minute uh, when I explain the main objectives of the competition law. Uh, the, the, um, the emphasis is completely shifted from the MRTP uh, objective to this. And as I said, MRTP was a toothless legislation by uh, the competition law, has enormous powers, very deterrent punitive powers. In fact, it's considered to be one of the most powerful regulators, market regulators. Moment. In MRTP, the dominance was determined by its size. Under the competition law, it is determined by the structure, the number of parameters which are taken up for this. The objective of the Competition Act can best be seen from the preamble. And as I just said, it I briefly explained the preamble of the Competition Act is, uh, I'll briefly read, an act to provide keeping in view the economic development of the country, and that's important. The focus is on economic development of the country. That's the ultimate objective goal to be achieved deliverable. So for the economic development of the country, for the establishment of the commission, commission CCI will be established with this, to prevent having adverse effect on competition, such practices which would be having adverse effect on competition, to promote and sustain competition in market, to protect the interest of consumers, and to ensure freedom of trade carried on by other participants in India. So these are the four pillars. And CCI is an instrument to achieve it. In fact, under Section 18 of the Competition Act, CCI has got duty. So the words used are shall, and it's the bounded duty of CCI to achieve these objectives because competition brings the best uh, in, in the economy, both the static and dynamic efficiency has been uh, ensured all over uh, through competition. When this, uh, when India got the competition law, we were 120th country in the world to have this kind of a body competition. In fact, it could have well been called competition promotion commission. So to promote competition and check these practices now, of course, there are more than 130. So section 18, which gives powers to the commission to act in CO motto, also mandates, uh, 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 gives the duty to the commission to ensure that these, uh, uh, these objectives are uh, achieved. The commission has, uh, the, the act has three uh, basic pillars. One is the anti-competitive agreements, section three, uh, abuse of dominance, section four, and then review of combinations, section five and six. The anti-competitive agreements, it is uh, a very wide and very powerful uh, uh, segment pillar, which uh, talks about an, uh, any anti-competitive agreement is per se violative of the competition law. 
it is not there by rule of reason. They are two separate things. One is per se by virtue of existence, and other is uh, it has to be proved by rule of reason. So agreement which uh, could cause appreciable adverse effect on competition. Double A E C. Uh, so the words are no one shall enter into any agreement. So it is per se. And there are a number of parameters in respect of production, supply, distribution, storage, acquisition, control of goods, or provision of services, which could cause appreciable adverse effect on markets in India. So, what is important that uh, the CCI is market regulated, it's concerned with the markets in India, not outside India. And it, a number of parameters are uh, given. Or to the CCI to judge whether there is an AAEC. Um, one is, for example, I'll quickly mention a few whether there are any creation of barriers to new entrants in the market, because that is what the preamble said there should be no, no barriers and there should be level playing field to all the entrants. Then, driving any existing competitor out of the market, I'll briefly explain how it is possible. Foreclosure of competition by hindering entry into the market, uh, accrual of benefits to the consumer, we have to ensure it, and improvement in production or distribution of goods or provision services. Uh, for example, if there is an uh, agreement among competitors that they will not undertake any research, development, or innovation in their uh, production of goods and services. This is something which is uh, not uh, allowed, it's anti-competitive. So uh, competition should bring out the best uh, in terms of the efficiencies uh, and technologies. So the consumer should get the best, both static and dynamic uh, uh, efficiencies. There could be agreements which could be horizontal and they could be vertical. In the horizontal uh, uh, agreements, it could be both in goods and services. So there could be an agreement to determine uh, in the purchase or sale price, limiting your control of production, sale, distribution, supply, and so on. As I'll briefly explain in the case of cement, for example, certain cement manufacturers had entered into uh, an agreement that uh, they would be uh, keeping their production low in spite of the fact that the market prices were going high, but they wanted to control the production still not going to 100% of the market demanded and also distribution of territories that you would send it there, you send it there. So idea was that the prices would increase and they could benefit from, from there. And then they could also be sharing the market there could be allocation of geographic areas, as I said, type of goods or services, number of customers you would handle with them. And there could be bid rigging or collusive bidding also in tenders. And a number of cases have come before the CCI. And the CCI has also come up with, uh, with its own uh, brochures and, uh, and, and regulations, how to ensure that uh, the bidders follow certain uh, rules by which uh, such things can be avoided. So these are the horizontal ones, but they could be vertical also. In the vertical uh, agreements, there could be agreements uh, among the players at different stages or levels of production chain in the production supply, uh, distribution, uh, storage, sale of prices and so on. And then there could be tie-in arrangements, there could be exclusive supply, exclusive distribution, there could be refusal to deal, uh, there could be resale price maintenance. This is another company uh, which has just come in the case of Maruti, for example. You might have read that Maruti has just been fined uh, 200 crores by CCI on the uh, common allegations of resale price maintenance because what they did was that uh, on inquiry it was found that uh, uh, they, they had prohibited their dealers not to give discounts above a certain level or whatever it is. So the, the price at which uh, the cars will be sold, uh, they, so there will be maintenance, the resale price it will go down. So uh, it is not allowed under the, uh, under the law because competition commission is uh, 
new service and they, they are very keen that consumers should get the best out of the competition. So let the dealers and others give out the best to them. There are certain exclusions under the uh, anti-competitive agreement provision section three, which relate to copyright act, patent act and so on. So uh, some uh, idea is to promote uh, technology and innovation. So uh, if some players have got uh, intellectual rights through these channels, copyright, patent and so on, so they could have agreements that they, they will only give it on certain uh, conditions. There are certain remedies available. How does CCI ensure uh, and control that nobody resorts uh, to any anti-competitive agreement? Under section 27 of the Act, the CCI has got powers to pass orders for cease and desist and interim order during the pendency of the inquiry. And if needed, they can uh, ask the uh, offending parties to modify the agreement they can impose penalties, which could be very hefty. And in the case of cartels, etc., it could go down, go up to uh, three times the profits or 10% of the annual turnover average. And uh, there have been instances when the penalties have been very, very high. So this was one vertical, one pillar, the anti-competitive agreements, which are both horizontal and vertical parts. Then there is a use of dominant position and uh, again, this is something which is uh, very important. Uh, in the pillar of dominant position and use, we have to first determine uh, whether the party is dominant. And for doing that, we have to first look at what is a relevant market. And relevant market has two uh, areas. One could be the relevant uh, geographic market and the other is relevant product market. So depending on the characteristics of the product or goods or services, uh, which are inter interchangeable and consumers preference and so on and so forth. In fact, recently I had, I delivered a, a longish talk on the abuse of dominance and what are the characteristics in the case law on this. And those of you who are interested, I can uh, share the uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I used at that time in the case law. But the, in the abuse of dominance, dominant position, uh, as I said, we have to first look at the relevant uh, market, both the product and the uh, and the and the geographic market. And uh, depending on that, in case the concerned party has uh, dominance in that area, geographic market in that particular product, then the commission could. Uh, decide whether they have abused. So one is decision on the dominance, another is the abuse. On the issue of uh, how do we decide whether uh, an enterprise is dominant or not, there are a number of characteristics which are given in the competition law, which could be market share, which could be size and resource of the enterprise, size and resource of the competitors, economic power of the enterprise, uh, vertical integration, dependence of consumers on the enterprise, extent of entry or exit barriers. If there are no exit or entry barriers, then they cannot be, it's difficult uh, that they would be a dominance. And then they would be countervailing uh, buying power, market structure, and uh, social cost and obligations. They could also be a dominance given uh, to a uh, uh, enterprise through statute and so on. And by the way, as I'll explain to you in a moment, uh, both the public sector and also the private sector are at par before CCI uh, in decision in these matters. So for example, CCI imposed a heavy penalty on Code India, even though it's a public sector undertaking about 1700 crores. Uh, or they are a monopolist, they are a, uh, they are a PSU, a monopolist, also dominant in this field, but they were found guilty of the uh, of abuse of dominance, so CCI imposed a hefty penalty, even though they are the public sector. And just by the way, uh, I would uh, briefly point uh, out your, your attention to 
section 2H of the competition law, which defines enterprise. And in the enterprise, uh, they could be the government departments, they could be PSUs, anybody. And the only exclusions are uh, that uh, those which are um, which are doing any sovereign functions and those who are uh, engaged in uh, certain activities like the atomic energy, currency, um, and so on, law and order, and so on. So I'll, I'll briefly come to a minute. So those activities uh, are those departments like the defense and the currency, the Ministry of Finance, currency division, and so on. So they are excluded. But all other uh, departments uh, which are engaged in any activity except those which are sovereign functions of the government. And sovereign under the case law has been defined as those which are the primary activities of uh, the state, inalienable and non-delegable. These three categories. Only these are such which could be covered under the sovereign functions of the government. All the remaining would have some component of economic activity. And having defined uh, an enterprise which could be dominant, uh, we have to see whether there are any, any instances of abuse of dominance. And for the abuse, um, uh, we, we have to see how can it be considered as abuse. Dominance is, uh, as I said, not a per se offense. It has to be proved by rule of reason that uh, there has been an abuse of dominance. And a few components, for example, would be whether it is placing any direct or indirect uh, unfair or discriminatory condition in the purchase of goods and services. So if it is doing that, there could be an abuse directly or indirectly including unfair or discriminatory price condition, which could include even the predatory price. And I'll briefly explain what is predation, predatory prices. If somebody sells something for a long period of time at a cost which is below the price, the uh, below the price, which uh, uh, could uh, which could have an intent where the, the, the idea could be how to make sure that the competitors are driven out of the market. Just for example, uh, without meaning it, Reliance is uh, a company with deep pockets, just for example. And they enter the market and then they keep the prices of their products, sold products, goods and services so low that all others are driven out of the market. And they continue doing it for years. And when everybody else is driven out of the market, then they raise the prices and they capture the market. So these know, this is known as predation. And the intent is also important. And I mean, if it's uh, sold for a year or two, it could be um, just sort of market entry and so on. But if the intention is to drive out the competitors and capture the market, so this is known as predatory pricing. So uh, that is again an abuse, and there were there were a number of instances in which I can briefly explain depending on the time. Uh, they could also be abused by if uh, a, a, an enterprise is dominant by limiting or restricting technical or scientific development, uh, which could be uh, against the interest of consumers, denying market access to everyone, and uh, using, uh, again, this is something which is very important, using its uh, dominance in one market uh, to enter into or protect another relevant market. Just for giving you an example, uh, in one of the cases which came up before me when I was the chairman, this was MCX versus the National Stock Exchange. And those of you who are interested can see this. And uh, there the allegation, and this was proved, that the National Stock Exchange, which is a dominant undertaking, it was using its dominance, uh, earning its money from one segment of its operations by subsidizing and giving at zero cost, the other service in order to uh, drive out or eliminate competition in the other segment of the market. So this was the allegation by MCX, it was found to be true. And abuses could be 
of two types. One could be an exploitative abuse, or another could be exclusionary abuse. Exploitative abuse is uh, when you are using your or abusing your dominance against the consumer or against your competitors. Exclusionary when you keep the competitors out. Like in this case, it was exclusionary. In exploitative, uh, there was another case, for example, the DLF case. Uh, there, the, the conditions uh, were such, which were uh, uh, one sided, and uh, it was held by the commission. The, the uh, conditions uh, related to exclude, uh, the exploitative abuse, and uh, I think these were like, for example, if I am an allottee, and if I delay uh, payment of a of my installment, I would have to pay uh, interest penalty at the rate of 18% penal interest. But if they delay uh, giving permission to me, I would only be getting uh, compensation at the rate of 5 rupee per square foot. It was not uh, equitable on both sides. There is a term in British law called contra procurentum, by which it means that in such a situation, the, the presumption would be against the body, against the person who has drawn the uh, agreement. So otherwise, I mean, there is a 50 page agreement, fine print and so on, who reads? So you are made to sign. So the presumption would be that uh, the person who has drawn this agreement, it's one-sided and they are, uh, it's meant to achieve uh, benefit out of this. So uh, this could be again something which is uh, uh, not uh, allowed under the law. Uh, the uh, commission has got wide powers. As I said, they could impose penalty up to 10% of the average turnover of the past three years. There is another provision under section 28 of the act under which commission can uh, divide and direct the uh, party uh, it would be divided um, if it is dominant to check the dominant it could dismantle in fact i used this uh, provision and i said in the beginning that the enforcement was taken up in two parts one was the anti-competitive agreements antitrust uh, abuse of dominance and antitrust section three and four which were taken up first from may 2020 but the other one, uh, which was uh, the review of combinations, it could not be taken up because the industry had not a reservation. Now, I used this uh, uh, section 28 provision at that time during my discussion uh, with the uh, associations and companies saying that if we don't have a uh, provision for review on the side, section five and six, then the commission still has got powers under section 28, which had been notified. So if there is any agreement which has been entered, then commission can dismantle that later under the powers if it, if it finds, uh, finds that uh, there's been a due of dominance. So it would be like unscrambling the egg. And I cited the example of the US uh, jurisdiction where it exactly the same thing happened. And uh, then the, uh, in fact, I got the chairman of FTFC to talk to in various uh, uh, forums. And then they, they finally agreed after everything was made clear to them. Section 5 and 6 were notified effective June. They were notified in March, but uh, they came into effect from June 2020. And that's how the third pillar, the regulation of combination, it came into being. Section, uh, under the regulation, section five and section six, they cover and uh, above a certain threshold, uh, if somebody acquires control, voting rights or assets uh, of another enterprise, and there are mergers and acquisition, uh, it is important to review so that uh, one makes sure that nobody acquires market power in a manner that uh, he or uh, the, the, the enterprise can control the functioning of the market or tilt the functioning in its favor, and there could be an appreciable adverse effect on competition. So, uh, in order to uh, 
to uh, satisfy the companies at that time, uh, we also uh, gave them an assurance that we try to in CCI approve most of the cases within 30 days. And uh, although the uh, commission has got a period of two and 10 days under the act, and uh, I also gave them an assurance that uh, we will introduce um, the preliminary consultation and we will help them in filing. And uh, uh, we'll be happy to hear that uh, during the last uh, decade or so of functioning from 2011, June until 2021, there have been about 800 cases which have uh, come up uh, for such uh, review of combinations and almost 95% plus have been approved in less than 30 days, in fact, 17 to 18 days. And uh, this preliminary consultation has also been functioning very well. Uh, so these are uh, some of the important pillars of the modern competition law. But let me also tell you some of the other uh, elements of the uh, competition law. CCI and our competition law are rated as among the most efficient and uh, most advanced jurisdictions in the world. As I mentioned, under Section 2H, the public and private sector are at par, and only uh, the activities of atomic energy, currency, defense, and space, and sovereign functions of the state, only that is excluded, everything else, they are at par. Commission under Section 18 uh, have got CO motor powers. It, it shall be the duty of the Commission to eliminate practices, etc., etc. Whatever is written in the preamble of the Act, which I read, I to read out to you. So CCI has the bounden duty to achieve that. Then under Section 32, Commission also has got the powers to see that if there is an agreement outside India, if there is anything happening outside India, which has got uh, adverse effect, appreciable adverse effect on markets in India. For example, if there is an agreement which has taken place outside the countries of India, but effect in uh, the markets in India, under Section 32, the Commission can look at it. Uh, under Section 33, the Commission has got powers to issue an interim order. Uh, we have issued it in the past. And the DLF case uh, order was issued similarly in several other cases. Uh, in fact, there was a time uh, when uh, I can tell you, uh, on every Wednesday, I would get a uh, request by somebody that so-and-so movie is being released in Bangalore, so-and-so movie is released in uh, Tamil Nadu. But the association is not allowing us to release. Uh, so Hindi movie is not allowing them. So idea was that uh, they were uh, the local association was dominant. And so we would hear them. We would issue a, an order in the section 33 that uh, they cannot do it, and the movie would be allowed to be released. With as you know, movies were generally released on Friday. So CCI had abused, had, had used its powers extensively where it was found that it was needed. Uh, apart from the uh, enforcement, CCI has got the third pillar, which is uh, competition advocacy. It's an important limb of CCI's activity where CCI is expected to take measures for promotion of competition advocacy, creating awareness and imparting training about competition issues. There is uh, one more provision, which I thought I'll mention here. That is about the uh, award of compensation. The appellate tribunal uh, under section 53N could award compensation to injured parties on application. So uh, this is an important provision which has not been used so extensively so far, but anybody who has got injured uh, can prove it as a result of anti-competitive behavior by somebody can file a case in this. They could also be a joint application, a collective application of this. Uh, there is a provision under section 54, 
of the constitution law, which gives powers to the central government to exempt by notification any class of enterprise in public interest. For example, they might say that in the case of mergers of banks, CCI would not look at it, only RBI would look at it, or in the case of shipping, for example, and so on. So uh, a few things have uh, uh, government have uh, from time to time used it, and the section 54 also used uh, uh, exemption of certain uh, smaller acquisitions under D minimus. So in the entire functioning of the CCI over the last uh, 12 years and uh, in the MNDA 10 years, CCI has uh, gone a uh, big way. So they have reviewed more than 1100 cases of anti-competitive agreements and abuse of dominance, which cover in various, uh, cover various sectors like airlines, banking, capital markets, infrastructure, travel, automobile, and so on, pharmaceuticals, and uh, uh, 800 cases for the mergers and acquisition, and they have done very well. And, uh, and they have been found and they are respected globally for what they have achieved. Another uh, uh, methodology or tool which has been used by the CCI extensively is uh, undertaking market study uh, in various areas because it brings out uh, what are the anti-competitive practices in various uh, sectors. For example, CCI undertook a study in the e-commerce sector and uh, they, 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 they brought out uh, a, a very good report in January 2020, after which they, was, uh, they also uh, started uh, investigation on, a, uh, on, on an application against Flipkart uh, and uh, Amazon, although it had existed thereafter, it was challenged and stayed, but against, opened against stayed, and so I finally, after a journey of nearly one and a half years, investigation is again begun. On the uh, merger control side, the uh, commission has got powers when they review. Uh, they can, uh, if they find that it could uh, result in any uh, any dominant uh, position, uh, and there is need of uh, uh, applying any remedies. So there could be uh, remedies which could be uh, structural remedies, they could be uh, behavioral remedies, and the uh, commission has not hesitated wherever it was required, but in 95% plus cases, they have approved most of the cases uh, straight away in 15 to 20 days. Uh, I know that you had uh, probably uh, wanted me to uh, set apart some time for Q&A, so I would, uh, in a couple of minutes, try to uh, round off my presentation here. Uh, we have got a long list of uh, cases which uh, would illustrate the uh, evolution of the jurisprudence. But I would draw your attention to one main case to all the participants. Uh, this was Competition Commission of India versus Steel Authority of India. Uh, which was taken up in 2010, the Supreme Court judgment of September uh, 2010, uh, written by Justice Swatantra Kumar. I would urge all the participants today to go through this judgment, which in my view is the most important judgment in the competition law till date, which, uh, which discussed, which dwelt upon the evolution of the competition law, which is the main subject today. And uh, uh, they have discussed everything, the journey in the MRTP, the evolution of the competition law, the functions of competition law, what was the legislative intent, what the CCI should do, what it should not do, the, the time limit and so on. So I would very strongly uh, urge all the participants to go through this judgment. And uh, this till today remains the most important one. There are a few others for paucity of time I would not uh, discuss, but one another thing which I could briefly mention is the Excel Crop Care versus CCI. And this uh, is another important landmark judgment where Supreme Court decided that uh, in imposition of penalty, 
it should be only the uh, relevant turnover which should be taken up, not the entire turnover. And uh, it was based on this, uh, a number of uh, other uh, cases were subsequently decided or appealed against. Uh, my final uh, uh, brief uh, mention would be about the uh, about the new age technologies in the digital market, which is uh, in the current era, uh, extremely important, both in terms of abuse of dominance or uh, in terms of the anti-competitive agreements and the mergers and acquisitions. So in the digital era, this becomes extremely important. And the last thing would be, which I would mention, how CCI has uh, uh, acted during the COVID-19, because the COVID situation was again some extraordinary situation, which warranted that uh, some of the companies may have to uh, may have to coordinate the supply and distribution, and at times uh, they would uh, have to make sure that uh, uh, in order to maintain supplies, in order to provide. Uh, goods and services in different areas, they may have to coordinate not with an intention to make money, but in order to maintain smooth supply. And uh, CCI uh, came up with its uh, guidelines facilitating this, allowing it. In, uh, as I said, intent is the most important thing, and it, this was permitted. Uh, one more thing which I thought I quickly mentioned that in the MND and in other things, a, a, an element of failing firm defense is sometimes used. If a company is likely to fail uh, and not able to uh, sustain, then if it is taken over by another enterprise, uh, a different view is taken because if it, is a, if it fails, then this would only mean lessening of competition. And the company, the CCI is, uh, is, uh, is zealous to ensure that uh, uh, competition is maintained and uh, uh, there are uh, as many players as possible to maintain the competition. And that is the essence of the whole thing. Well, friends, I really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, I would have liked to go on to cover a few more things, but Actually, the time is not there. And I would be very happy if uh, there are any questions. I'll be glad to answer within the available time. If you have any more questions or any doubts later, I'll be glad to uh, respond later also if you like to. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thanks, Varsha. And uh, over to you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your wonderful insights. So we have a few questions. Our uh, first question is by Anumeha, wherein she is asking that the Act provides that horizontal agreements include cartels as well. So what are the other kinds of um, agreements which are included within the uh, definition of horizontal agreements? Well, I have already uh, elaborated the various names of horizontal agreements. Cartel is one kind of horizontal agreement where, in fact, if you look at uh, the genesis of the U.S. antitrust law, the Sherman Act, they used to be cartels. So the cartel is a type of uh, horizontal agreement where people at this in the same trade and uh, horizontally working horizontally, they could decide on price fixation, they could decide on uh, uh, distribution of territory and so on and so forth. But this is one kind and like in tendering and so on. But there could be many kinds of horizontal agreements, which uh, um, there are dozens of others. So let us, for positive time, let me not dwell into it. Cartel is one specific, and cartel is very pernicious kind of horizontal agreement, where uh, in the case of Roman cartels, uh, commission has been taking very serious uh, uh, approach and imposing maximum fines. Thank you, sir. Then there is a second question by Anumeha only, uh, wherein she's asking how trade associations proliferate anti-competitive concerns and what is Havan's scope model? Good 
question. Uh, I would uh, uh, explain briefly, and then uh, in case somebody wants to uh, go deeper into it, I have written a uh, very big paper on uh, this subject, which uh, I wrote along with uh, another uh, uh, expert, Professor Rahul Singh of uh, National Law University, Bangalore. And this paper is available, those of you who wish to read. It was published in several uh, uh, reputed journals. Now, in the case of trade associations, trade associations are permitted uh, in a fora uh, where the competitors can meet and they can discuss various issues. They can discuss uh, how to, uh, they can discuss the government regulations which have been uh, announced and then how to uh, improve their products and their new R&D and so on. Number of things which could be permitted, they could discuss. So if they start discussing the prices, if they can start, this, if they start discussing the territories and so on, various things which are not permitted, prohibited under the competition law, then the role of trade association uh, is uh, something which is immediately frowned upon and uh, the commission can look into it. So trade associations, they have to function very carefully. And that's why we always uh, recommend that uh, they should record minutes of their meeting. They should keep uh, a lawyer during the meeting who can immediately raise red flag that this is something which you are discussing, which is not allowed to discuss. And also, uh, at times, if there is any such thing which is being discussed, since all those who are present at that time become guilty, there is a, uh, there is a sort of complaint sometime. So those who feel that they should, they don't want to, they should get out and ask the uh, association secretariat to record that uh, they have left the meeting. So uh, trade associations, they have a huge responsibility to make sure that they function according to law. And uh, there are uh, various uh, written instances and regulations. And my paper would draw light, uh, through light on this. Also, the CCI has got uh, a number of uh, pamphlets and, uh, and, uh, uh, and regulations which they have issued uh, guidelines. So I would suggest those who are interested can uh, look at CCIE website and go through this. And in case you wish to talk to me later, you are very welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Our next question is by Mr. Chintan, wherein he is asking, what are the factors that CCI may consider uh, to regulate the balance between promotion of innovation and abuse of dominance? especially when such players tries to bring innovative products and services in a market? No, there is no contradiction in this. If there is a uh, big company which wants to bring uh, new products and services, innovative products and services in the market, it's very welcome. Uh, it is not uh, in any way violative of the act. However, it must be uh, issued must be recognized that uh, by the gale of, uh, uh, of new technologies, a number of earlier players could be demolished. And you have seen in the past, Kodak, for example, it used to be such a dominant firm. And in 98, uh, when digital photography came into being, then uh, nobody would use the films. Number of other things we have seen it. So the gain of technological advancements means that earlier technologies and their products go out of fashion. So there is uh, nothing wrong in this if new products or services are being introduced and it's not an abuse in any sense of the term. On the other hand, it is promoted, and uh, that's what the object of the competition law is that uh, there should be innovations uh, and that's how the competition uh, prospers. 
Thank you, sir. Our next question is by Karan, uh, wherein he's asking that the act empowers the CCI to impose interim measures. However, there have been very few cases wherein the CCI imposed uh, uh, interim measures and the last one was uh, in OYO case, which was stayed by the Gujarat High Court. So he's asking, uh, do you really think that CCI's high standards in granting interim measures has proved to be an impediment for gaining the trust of consumers and business class of India? Uh, I would again strongly suggest, please read the judgment of Justice Swatantra Kumar of 2010 CCI versus State Authority of India. There is a full paragraph on this where the Supreme Court has held that CCI should use these powers sparingly. So CCI is supposed to be very circumspect and use these powers sparingly. So Supreme Court has held it. And that's the intention of the jurisprudence at the moment. Yes, so, uh, that was the last question. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for um, giving your valuable insights on how the Competition Act has come into picture. And uh, you've also explained um, almost all the aspects of the Competition Act 2002 in brief. And I'm sure participants would have gained a lot of knowledge through this session. Uh, we are thankful for you to spare time for this session. And we look forward to having you in our future courses as well. Thank you once again to all the participants and thank you, sir. Thank you, Varsha, and thank you to all the participants. Before I leave, let me tell you that, uh, first of all, I'd like to give my best wishes to each one of you. Those of you who wish to take up the competition law as their career, this is one of the most lucrative and remunerative area of competition law, where possibly the competition is also not much. The competition in the field of competition law is not much. And uh, those of you who wish to adopt this as their career could possibly do it with a lot of attractive remunerative cases, uh, which uh, relatively as compared to the other areas of uh, law, you would find slightly easier. So my best wishes to all of you and I hope you uh, do very well to flourish and prosper. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir.